And uh, actually, my lab is uh, interested in how the Fanconi pathway promotes the incisions that unhook DNA into strand crosslinks. Uh, and today, I will mainly talk about the uh, role of uh, the endonuclease XPFERCC1 in this process. Uh, and we are interested in how this uh, endonuclease performs the ICL repair specific function um, in contrast to all uh, its roles in other DNA repair pathways. So, um, Agatha already gave a nice introduction on Fanconi anemia. Um, so, it's, it's a disease that um, is caused by the uh, mutation in any of the 19 currently known Fanconi genes. Uh, it causes uh, bone marrow failure and an increased risk of cancer, and cells uh, of Fanconi anemia patients are very sensitive to interstrand crosslinks. Uh, the Fanconi anemia pathway uh, consists of these 19 uh, genes, and one of the key activating steps is the ubiquitization of Fank I and Fank D2 by the E3 Fanconi core complex in combination with a uh, Fanconi E2 enzyme. And this ubiquitization then uh, results in a chromatin recruitment of this uh, complex. Uh, and uh, there's actually several factors within the Fanconi anemia pathway that are actual repair pa uh, uh, factors and that function in other DNA repair pathways as well. But it's been emerging in the past years that several of these Fanconi factors may actually have a very ICL repair specific function. And we hope to convince you that that's also the case for uh, XPF. So just to, uh, so that we're all on the same page, DNA interstrand crosslinks are mainly repaired during the replication of DNA. Uh, they can form uh, endogenously by uh, meso metabolic byproducts um, su such as aldehydes um, and, and pro uh, possibly other uh, met metabolites, but they can also be induced exogenously by uh, agents that are used in chemotherapy such as cisplatin and mitomycin C. And we actually uh, try to understand how the Fanconi anemia factors uh, uh, repair such DNA interstrand crosslinks. Uh, and to uh, do this, we use the Xenobus egg extract system that was also already introduced by uh, Justin. Um, and we can actually repair a single site-specific uh, DNA interstrand crosslink. And the system was developed in the, in the Walter Laboratory by uh, mainly by, by uh, Marcus Reschler, and, and, and I was fortunate enough to help him in the final stages of its development. <coughs> and this system now allows us to uh, actually look at repair of uh, the site-specific ICL, and we mainly in our lab use a cisplatin-based ICL. Uh, and by uh, looking at the regeneration of a SAP site that is normally blocked by the ICL, we can uh, quantify repair, and we have shown that this is completely dependent on active DNA replication. Now, because this uh, reaction is rather synchronous, we can also look at the various steps that lead to its repair, and we can visualize certain steps such as the unhooking incisions, lesion bypass, uh, but also homologous recombination and the recruitment of specific factors to the ICL. So this system, uh, together with uh, some, some data that was known from the literature, then uh, led to this uh, following model, where during replication, um, two replication forks actually collide on the ICL and stall uh, about 20 to 40 nucleotides from the ICL. And this uh, dual fork collision is actually required for repair, which was very elegantly uh, shown by the Walton Lab uh, recently. Then one of the replication forks uh, approached the ICL to within one nucleoti nucleotide, uh, and dual incisions on the parental strand unhook the ICL, and then allow a lesion bypass reaction that occurs in various steps. Uh, first, a, a nucleotide is inserted across from the unhooked adduct um, by an unknown translesion polymerase, and then a REF7 in combination with uh, REF1 um, does the extension uh, of this strand. And the final steps uh, involve homologous recombination and possibly nucleotide excision repair to remove the uh, adduct. So when I was still uh, in Johannes's lab, we wanted to figure out what the Fanconi anemia pathway would do in this uh, ICL repair scheme. Uh, and we found out that it actually the Fank I and Fank D2 and its ubiquitization are absolutely required to uh, perform these unhooking incisions. Um, however, this complex itself doesn't actually make these incisions, and we in follow-up work in my own lab uh, showed that it's actually uh, the endonuclease XPF ERCC1 together with this, this large scaffolding protein SLX4 that is required for these incisions. 
Uh, and about uh, at the same time, these two proteins were uh, identified as uh, Fanconi anemia proteins, really indicating that this uh, incision step is a very uh, important step in the Fanconi uh, anemia pathway and in ICL repair. So the way we actually showed that uh, XPF era CC1 performs these incisions is by uh, immunodepleting uh, XPF from our extract, which uh, completely blocked uh, ICL repair. However, what we found is when we added back recombinant XPF era CC1, we could not rescue the repair defect. Um, and we then found out that depleting XPF actually leads to the co-depletion of this uh, scaffolding factor uh, SLX4, uh, and that finally we managed to rescue the repair defect by not only adding XPF or CC1, but also SLX4. So the fact that SLX4 is uh, almost completely co-depleted with XPF means that in extract, at least, it's, it's most likely always in a complex. Uh, and it's also probably uh, recruited to the ICL in a complex because the recruitment of these factors to the ICL occurs really simultaneously. Uh, and we also managed uh, to show that the recruitment of XPF uh, fully depends on the presence of SLX4 and that the recruitment of this incision complex uh, is facilitated by ubiquitization of FANG-D2. So what we were then really intrigued about is uh, now we found this uh, direct role of XPF ERCT1 in ICL repair. How does this role actually distinguish from the role of this endonuclease and other DNA repair pathways? And the reason why we think that this can be distinguished is because various mutations in XPF ERCC1 actually cause different disease phenotypes. Um, so that's what the, the rest of my talk will be about. Uh, and first, I would just uh, like to give you a little bit more information about XPF ERCC1. Uh, XPF is a large protein that contains an N-terminal SF2-like helic helicase domain for which we actually really don't know what it, uh, what it does. Uh, except probably binding DNA. Uh, more to the C terminus, it has its nuclease domain, and of the far C terminus, it has its helix, stern helix domain with, with which it interacts with ERCC1. And ERCC1 also contains an actually an, an inactive helicase domain. Now, this endonuclease likes to cut structures that have three prime ends, such as uh, splayed arms or uh, stem loops or three flap structures. Um, and uh, at the atomic level, actually very little is known about this uh, complex. This is a, this is a model that, uh, that was published uh, a while ago that's based on the structure of the two helix, uh, two helix loop helix domains of XPF and ERCC1 in combination with the structure of the inactive nuclease domain of ERCC1 uh, and the archaeal homologue of uh, the catalytic domain of uh, XPF. And this shows how it could actually bind to the double-stranded, single-stranded uh, junction uh, of a DNA structure. However, there's this really large helicase domain that is, that is sitting somewhere. We have no clue where, and we also don't know how it is involved in, in, the, in, in the function of XPF or CT1. So uh, XPF or CT1 functions in various DNA repair pathways. I've, I've told you this, and it's... Uh, it's most well known for its role in nucleotide excision repair. Uh, nucleotide excision repair repairs bulky lesions that happen on one of the strands, such as UV lesions. Um, and uh, it can be separated in a global uh, NER pathway and a pathway that is coupled to transcription. And these two pathways only differ by how these lesions are detected and not by the actual processing. Then, as I've shown you, it functions in DNA interstrand crosslink repair, and it also has been reported to have functions in, in double strand break repair and telomere maintenance, but these have not been very well studied. So if you have a mutation in XPF or CC1, you actually can uh, develop uh, various diseases. Uh, for example, one of them uh, is uh, xeroderma pigmentosum, which, uh, and all of these actually um, uh, result in developmental defects, um, but they also have their own special characteristics. So XP causes UV sensitivity and a cancer predisposition, and it probably is caused by a defect in global uh, nucleotide excision repair. Then there's disease, uh, this disease called cocaine syndrome, uh, which uh, does not show cancer predisposition, but a, an, a very clear neurodegeneration in the patient. And this is caused by a defect in transcription-coupled nucleotide excision repair. 
And then there is this uh, disease called COPS, which is actually a combination between uh, XP and CES, and is caused by a, a defect in both of these uh, NER pathways. In addition, you can develop a Fanconi anemia, which I've talked about uh, before, which is probably caused by a defect in ICL repair. And finally, there's a very uh, extreme progeroid syndrome, which is called XFE, which is caused by a lack in all of these DNA repair uh, pathways. So we were actually really interested in uh, trying to uh, come up with a reason of why certain mutations in XPF ERC21 specifically cause Fanconi anemia. So we were um, um, uh, trying to collect a lot of mutations for which we expected they had a specific role in interstrand crosslink repair. So I'll just take you through the, uh, the mutations that we made and the, purif and, and the proteins we purified. So there's actually only two Fanconi anemia patients known with mutations in XPF, or FANQ, as it's also uh, called. And these are uh, the L230P, and under here is the uh, human uh, numbering, and up here is the Xenopus numbering, which is going to be important later. Uh, this is a heterozygous uh, mutation, and the other allele has a functional null mutant. Uh, it has a Fanconi phenotype, but no photosensitivity, which probably means that it's, it's functional in nucleotide excision repair, uh, consistent with the cells being sensitive to mitomycin C, but only mildly sensitive to UV. Uh, this protein is lowly expressed in cells, but overexpression uh, rescues the UV sensitivity, but not the mitomycin C sensitivity, which indicates there's probably a functional defect that this mutation is causing. Now, the other Fanconi anemia mutant is the uh, R689S mutant, which is actually has very similar phenotypes uh, as the previous one, uh, but the levels of the protein are normal, also indicating a functional defect in this protein. Uh, then there is a mutation, the C236R, which is very complicated, and, and, and we don't really understand uh, how it works, but it can actually cause a Fanconi anemia phenotype. However, there's a patient that when you only have this mutation and a functional null on the other, you actually don't have a Fanconi phenotype, which is something uh, the authors of this paper don't really understand, and we don't understand it either, so we just want to study these mutants to get a little bit more insight into this. In addition, there's this mutant, mutant that causes the progeroid syndrome, um, which uh, has a Fanconi phenotype and causes mitomycin C sensitivity, um, which also may be caused by very low protein levels, but we wanted to study this. And finally, there's also this uh, mutation that was actually picked up from a screen for cancer, breast cancer susceptibility. We know very little about it, but just that it causes mitomycin C sensitivity, but no UV sensitivity. And the last set of mutations are actually also in the helicase domain. Um, there was this one, uh, this one amino acid that was uh, indicated to be important for SLX4 interaction, which we show was really important for ICL repair. Uh, <clears throat> so we wanted to look at this mutation and to make actually this interaction even, even worse, we decided to delete not only this single amino acid, but also a predicted uh, region around it was, that was predicted on, based on secondary structure predictions to form a, a loop. So these are all the mutants, uh, and these are all the regions of XPF that we are targeting. Uh, and we first set out to purify these proteins. Um, most of the proteins actually purified nicely, just as a wild type, with a large uh, peak um, uh, coming off on the gel filtration column, representing the active heterodimer, and a small aggregate peak, and we collect the active heterodimers. Um, so a lot of these mutants were purified nicely, but there were actually two uh, mutants uh, that really showed a lot of aggregation, and these were uh, these were depicted over here. So this is actually the L219R uh, mutation. This is not the patient mutation, but the P mutation we couldn't even express. So when we mutated this proline to an uh, arginine, we could express it, but it was largely aggregated, and also this delta loop mutant was largely aggregated. Uh, however, when we collect this heterodimer peak and rerun it on a gel filtration, it still comes off as a heterodimer, and it turns out to be fully active. So we think we are, we've made the, the active protein here. And this is just a Comasi gel to show the purification. 
So we then tested all, all our purif uh, purified proteins for our uh, nuclease activity, and we used this assay where we use a, a three uh, sort of splayed arm template with a fluorescent tag and a quencher on the other side, and cutting of XPF actually frees this, 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 this fluorescent uh, a piece uh, which we then can uh, read out in a, uh, uh, in a fluorescence meter. <laughs> right, so as you can see, all our mutants are active except for one, which is this um, R670S mutation, which uh, also was sh uh, shown previously. The human mutant is also uh, showing very little activity, uh, and I will come back to that a little bit later. So the next question we wanted to ask was, do these mutants actually inhibit ICL repair? It's, it's, it's uh, always nice that we know for several mutants that they cause mitomycin C sensitivity, but actually being uh, directly involved in ICL repair uh, uh, still requires to be shown. So we use our assay in which we use as a readout the regeneration of the SAP1 site. Um, and we first chose uh, the mutations at the uh, N-terminal part of the helicase-like domain and in the nuclease domain, and mutating all of these residues basically caused a defect in interstrand cross-link repair. And the way we do this is that we uh, deplete uh, endogenous XPF or ERCC1 and add back these mutants together with wild-type SLX4, which is co-depleted with the depletion. So then we looked at these uh, two mutants that we uh, thought would interfere with SLX4 interaction, and we found that the, pu uh, the point mutant actually is uh, nicely rescuing repair, while the deletion of this larger loop completely abrogates repair, uh, indicating that it's um, important for the, uh, for the repair process. So we uh, um, show you here five mutants that are defective in interstrand crosslink repair, and then we wanted to measure their activity in nucleotide excision repair. Uh, and for this, we uh, set up an assay that was previously used uh, by Pierre-Henri Gaillard, actually. Um, and um, you incubate a UV-treated uh, plasmid in Xenopus egg extracts. You get uh, an NER complex forming on it. You get incisions by XPF and XPG that cut out a piece of the DNA that contains the lesion. And then this lesion is filled in by something that's called unscheduled DNA synthesis. And you can measure this uh, by the incorporation of radioactivity. So on this gel, you can see that uh, after UV treatment, you get incorporation. But if you lack XPF, or CC1, you get much less incorporation of radioactivity, but if you now add back the recombinant protein, you can rescue this. So this is how this is quantified, and we performed this assay for all our mutants, and we found that actually all our mutants were able to fully rescue uh, nucleotide excision repair, uh, and just to make sure we were looking at the uh, proper uh, activity, we also included this completely catalytic dead mutant of XPF, and that is not uh, able to rescue uh, NER. So with this uh, results, we show we now have, uh, uh, yes, and one thing I have to mention here is that this mutant that was actually very low in nuclease activity is actually fully able to rescue NER, which is uh, very interesting. So we now um, uh, uh, proven that we have five mu uh, separation of fun function mutants, and they spread over the entire uh, uh, sequence of XPF over several domains, and we wondered why these mutants are defective in ICL repair. So first of all, we checked whether their defect is caused by a defect in ICL unhooking, and I don't have time to show the, the results here, but indeed we showed that all the defective uh, mutants were uh, showing a defect in ICL unhooking, so we were looking at the, the step that we know uh, XPF or CC1 is involved in. So then we wondered whether these proteins were uh, recruited to the ICL, because of course that could be one thing that, that goes wrong. Uh, and to look at this, we used, uh, again, uh, this chip assay where we can show that a wild-type protein is recruited to the ICL at the time of incisions, but if you remove XPF, obviously you get no recruitment. And we first um, addressed our attention to these um, mutations that we expected would interfere with SLX4 interaction because we've shown before that the interaction with SLX4 is absolutely required for the recruitment of uh, XPF or CC1, so we expected they would have a problem here. However, they didn't. They were just normally uh, recruited to the side of the ICL, which uh, indicates that they might not have an SLX4 interaction uh, defect. So we then turned to these uh, mutations in the nuclease domain and also found that they were normally recruited to the ICL. 
And finally, um, we looked at these um, mut mutations at the N-terminal part of the helicase-like domain uh, and were able to show that um, while this uh, C225R mutation is normally recruited, the mutations only six uh, residues upstream at position 219 really completely abrogates the recruitment of this protein to the lesion. Um, which would uh, suggest that it has a problem with interaction with SLX4. Uh, and to prove that, we performed uh, an assay where we co-expressed flag tag XPF ERCC1 and his tag SLX4 and SF9 cells uh, and looked at uh, the uh, capability of XPF to co-IP uh, uh, SLX4. Now, this goes normal with the wild-type proteins, but actually, if you have this L219R mutant, you you do not pull down SLX4 uh, with it. Um, and in contrast, you actually do pull down SLX4 with this mutant uh, in this loop that was predicted to mess up SLX4 interaction. So in conclusion, uh, this L219R mutant really showed reduced interaction with SLX4, while the predicted side does not. Uh, and the reason why we think that this is is... Um, so this previously shown interaction site with SLX4 uh, and the use of hybrid assays that were done to, to show this were performed with an, an, an SLX4 that lacks the MLR domain. And we by now know, know from uh, work by Agata and other uh, labs that the MLR domain is crucial for XPF interaction. And we think actually this L219R residue probably is involved in this interaction while the G314 is interact, interacts with the BTB domain as they showed, but this is not a major side and if you mutate it, it actually doesn't abrogate interaction. Uh, so uh, the final uh, slide uh, I want to just uh, conclude. We have uh, identified five separation of function mutants, and we think that uh, they affect ICL repair by actually uh, a variety of different mechanisms. One is that one of these mutations affects the interaction directly with SLX4. These mutations uh, likely affect the positioning of uh, XPF within the repair complex, possibly by an uh, interaction with SLX4, but maybe by interaction with other proteins that we don't know. And we think these um, mutations in the nuclease domain are really important for providing substrate, stu substrate specificity for an, an ICL substrate. And this is based on the fact that both of these residues uh, if you look at structures that are homologous to XPF, could really be involved in direct interaction uh, with the DNA. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, finish and thank the people who've done the work. So most of this work was done by a graduate stu student, Daisy, in my lab, who will be on the job market soon, and uh, she has done fantastic work. She's been helped by technician Rick, and uh, all the other lab members have helped in, in discussion and, and, and everything. And, I would like to thank you for your attention and be happy to take questions.